in the last two sessions, we started with uh, robustness of neural networks. When we take them into production, we want our networks to be robust, especially to adversarial attacks. The first paper that noticed this property that neural networks have blind spots was this paper, Intriguing Properties of Neural Networks. And then we said we wanted to have a faster method of coming up with adversarial examples so that we can actually come up with defense. Maybe adding those adversarial examples to our training set could help the network become more robust. So in this literature, there is uh, going back and forth between attacking networks and coming up with defense against those attacks. So this paper is also about a new way of attacking our networks and a new way of looking at how to attack and come up with adversarial examples. I guess so far we covered an example. The first paper was an example of an L2 adversarial example, L2 norm. It means that the adversarial example needs to be close to a natural example in L2 sense, in L2 norm. We can have L infinity, which is the previous paper. You can have L0, and depending on the norm, you can have different types of adversarial examples. L0 is very nice because you are changing very few uh, pixels in your image. As you can see, there are some, probably you don't see it's very small, but there is a blue, red, blue, and different colors that you see on the pixel level. So you can change a few pixels, and then the algorithm is going to confuse the classification. You see it better here. You're changing a couple of pixels on your image. Still, to the eyes of a human, we can all distinguish the difference between a zero and one, even if you change a bunch of pixels. But uh, let me go through a couple of notation before we understand what the paper is actually trying to do. So we have two types of adversarial examples. One is targeted. The other one is untargeted. For targeted, you specify a wrong class and you want the image to be classified to that particular target that you chose beforehand. The first paper was an example of a ad targeted adversarial example. The second paper was about untargeted. You just wanted to, the network to make a mistake. Let's define them more rigorously. So X is an input image. C a star of X. Let's say this is the correct label for X in your data set. So that's the correct label. And let's say T is a target because we want to deal with targeted adversarial examples. So we are going to specify a target. And we want T to be not equal to the true target, the true class label. We are looking for an adversarial input, X prime. And uh, C of X prime is going to denote the predicted label for X prime. And what we want is that we want C of X prime to be equal to the target that we specified beforehand. So that's a targeted adversarial example. And we want X and X prime to be close according to some metric. Let it be L2 distance, L infinity distance, L0 distance, I don't know, distance on the sphere, etc. And what is an R tar untargeted adversarial example? You don't have any targets. You just want your C of X prime to be different from the correct label for X. So as soon as you classify a one as a zero, that's a success for your adversarial example. But in the case of a targeted adversarial example, you want your one to be classified as a five. Five is your target. So is this clear, the difference between the two? Okay, perfect. Now let's take a look at the attack algorithm that we covered in the first paper. In that paper, our D, the distance, was L2 distance. And then you wanted the uh, predicted class for your adversary to be a particular target. And in that case, we had L2. You can also have L0, L infinity, etc. And as I said, L infinity distance is interesting because for L infinity, you are going to be counting the number of pixels in your image that are different. And that's going to be the distance. So it's going to be a count. So here is the meat of the paper. So you define a function f. Why are we doing this? Because solving that problem is hard. And we saw that even in the first paper. We had to work with the loss function here. Now, what this paper is suggesting is that you define a function f 
such that this property holds. We want this property, C of X plus Delta to be our target. And we want to have an equivalent uh, condition. And our equivalent condition is gonna be defined in the form of this F. As soon as F of X plus Delta, F of our adversary is less than or equal to zero, uh, this condition holds. And as soon as this condition holds, we want the other condition to hold. So now it's a matter of choosing F because once you choose F, you can plug that condition in place of this condition and hope that the, uh, uh, the minimization problem that you end up with is a simple one, is, that, is actually solvable. So here's an example. There are multiple examples. You can take a look at the paper, but this is the one that they're gonna end up using, using in the end. So F of X prime is the positive part. So this is just the maximum of the argument and zero. And we want this to be less than or equal to zero. I'm gonna break this function down and then you're gonna see why this is doing exactly what we want it to do. But first, Z of X prime are the logits. Oh, so Theodore asked it. So Z of X prime are before you apply the softmax in your network. So these are your logits or unnormalized log probabilities. And for instance, if you have 1000 classes, you're gonna get 1000 numbers or a vector that is 1000 dimensional. And when you index it with T, we are indexing it with, uh, we are picking up that target. For instance, in this case, before applying the softmax, you're gonna have 10 numbers, Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4, Z5, Z6, etc. And then let's say your target is six. So you pick Z6. That's what this notation here means. And this is Z of X prime for all of the i's except for t. And what do we want? We want zt to be the maximum one. In that case, our network is making a mistake. On the target, if the logit is having the highest value, then our classifier is gonna classify our image to this particular target. And we are forcing it to make a mistake. So let's see what is x prime. x prime is x plus delta. And we know that our, uh, our algorithm is gonna predict a label for x prime using this notation, using this uh, by maximizing, by finding the R max of the soft max of our logits. And I is just the coordinates of Z. So is this clear so far? What is Z? So there is a question. So first, did I, add, did I answer your question about Z and what that is? Yeah, Z is clear. Now, now I'm curious about this like superscript plus notation. Does that mean that you're only going to select that value if it's positive? Yes, so that one I'm gonna explain. So your question about is about this positive. Yeah, and I, I guess in, implying then how would F ever be negative? Yeah. Um, yeah. So that plus is just the maximum of the argument and zero. So is this clear? We are taking the maximum of this term and zero. Yes. And that's just the definition of this plus. Yes. Now let's take a look at this. If f of x prime is less than or equal to zero, so if this term is less than or equal to zero, it means that the maximum of this term and zero is less than or equal to zero. It means that the argument is less than or equal to zero. It means that the maximum of all the other classes or the logits for all of the other classes is less than or equal to the target one, okay? And you can also go backward. If this is greater than or equal to the maximum, then that's gonna be positive and you're gonna pick up the maximum of a positive number and zero and you're gonna get the term on the left. That's what is gonna go inside our objective function. So if we manage to make f of x prime less than or equal to zero, then our particular target, the logit for that particular target is gonna be the biggest. And once that happens, we are making our network to classify that adversarial example to our target, which is equivalent to this condition here. So we want F to be actually less than or equal to zero. We don't want it to be close to zero. We want it to be less than or equal to zero. For some of the adversarial examples, this, uh, condition holds by default. For some of them, the harder ones, it's not gonna happen. It means that this maximum is gonna be bigger than the target. For those, of, for those cases, we are gonna penalize. And we're gonna say, 
minimize that. So does that answer your question, Theodore? Yeah, I kind of want to follow up. So it seems like, um, just if I'm understanding this right, if F is big and more positive, it means that we are unable to find a good or like our um, our current adversarial example is not good at pushing towards the target. Um, whereas if F is small, we've found a, a good adversarial example. X prime is able to move towards the, the target T. Exactly. So okay. you want your F of X prime to be less than or equal to zero. If it is positive, it means that one other target, one other logit is dominating. Yeah. It's not the one that you're interested in. It's it's still okay. So like it means one of the one of the output classes is still stealing some attention, and then we want to minimize that. And yeah, okay, yeah, yes. So what we are seeing here is very similar to the hinge loss. You can actually use that for doing classification. So this could be your loss, and hinge loss is coming from support vector machines. Okay, these are not new ideas, but we are just seeing them in this course. I think it's the first time that we are seeing such an objective. But it's smart. It means that all you need to do is look at your uh, logits, the log of your unnormalized probabilities. So I want this to be clear for everybody. Is it or does it need more explanation? So the idea is that we want the logit of the target to dominate. And that objective function is going to help us do that. And why do I call the constraint an objective? Because then you can put a Lagrange multiplier on this objective and this constraint and put it inside your objective function. So in the end, this is the problem that we want to solve. We want to minimize the perturbation to an input image. That's going to give us an adversarial example such that this condition holds. So in the first paper, they were doing, they were putting a loss function there. Now we are defining an, an F and that's going to be our function that we're going to deal with. This is our constraint. So we replace C of X plus Delta equals T with F of X plus Delta less than or equal to zero. And as I said, you're gonna take, you're gonna put a Lagrange multiplier on your constraint and put it inside your objective function. And that's the term that you get. And that distance could be any distance. Now we are gonna specify our distance. We are gonna say we are gonna be looking in the family of LP distances. For instance, L2, L infinity, L0, etc. So we want to minimize the perturbation plus a Lagrange multiplier of f of x plus delta. And now we want to deal with this constraint. And that constraint, you can deal with it in a smart way. You can reparameterize rather than solving for delta. We are going to solve for omega. Tan h is a function that is between negative one and one. And now if you take x, put it take it to the left side, that's gonna give you x plus delta. Tan h was a function between negative one and one. So tan h plus one is gonna be a number between zero and two. And that's why you need the one half to put it between zero and one. So rather than minimizing for delta, we are gonna minimize for w. And that, that way you're gonna take care of this constraint. And then it's gonna be an unconstrained optimization problem and uh, you can solve it. Any questions so far? So it turns out that defense distillation, actually we covered distillation when we were talking about small networks. It turns out that the same algorithm could be a very good defense mechanism for other algorithms prior to this work. And this work is saying that defense distillation is not gonna work for, this, uh, for the type of attacks that are gonna result from this algorithm. But what is defense distillation? Let's, let's remember it. So you had a softmax, it had a temperature, and we said if uh, the temperature goes to zero, the softmax is just focusing on one of the entries. It's just a max function, maximum of, I don't know, 10 numbers. And if t goes to infinity, you're gonna have a uniform distribution. So that's the role of the temperature. Distillation, and actually defensive distillation, is the algorithm that we saw before. It's exactly the same thing. You have a teacher network. In the previous paper, we were saying uh, we have a large network or massive network that we wanted to summarize or distill in a smaller network. Here we have a teacher network and we're gonna train it using T as our temperature. We are gonna generate data from the teacher network with the same temperature we're gonna train the distilled network on the data generated by the teacher network. And in prediction, we are gonna set the temperature to be one. 
and use a distilled network for testing and doing inference. The difference between defensive distillation and uh, distillation that we saw in the previous paper is that previously it was a large network. We were trying to summarize it in a smaller network. Here, the teacher and the distilled networks have the same architecture. That's the only difference. So this uh, algorithm, defensive distillation, was able to make the network more robust against the type of attacks that we saw in the previous two papers. But then uh, here, we see that you can have adversarial examples even to networks that are trained using defensive distillation. And the way that you come up with adversarial examples is using this algorithm. So what are we seeing in this figure? That is your source classification. That's the target that you choose. And if your norm is L2, you can make your network to incorrectly classify zero as a one, zero as a two, zero as a three. And as you can see, all of these look very similar to each other. Similarly for one, you can make it to be classified as zero, to be classified as two, etc. That's for L2 distance, for L0 distance. You can start noticing it here when you have sevens. And for L, L infinity, uh, I don't even see the difference. Maybe there are some differences when we want to classify a seven as a six. I see some noticeable pattern, but other than that. Is there any um, reason or any deeper reason why we consider these different norms and the adversarial examples measured in these different norms? Like are, are certain application domains, we expect certain adversarial attacks to take certain forms? Uh, not really. So the thing is that uh, prior to this work, some of the methods were using L2 distance and some of them were using L infinity. And some of them were using pointwise attacks like L0. Mm -hmm. And this paper is saying that regardless of the norm and regardless of the, whether you use defense distillation or no, I can make your network make mistakes Got it. with 100% failure using this approach. And the key idea is using an F function that is equivalent to your constraint. Got it. So any other questions? I'm curious if it um, talked in this paper about which of these norms was the easiest or the hardest to target. Like are, are um, these algorithms or are these networks generally more robust to attacks in the L2 norm or the L0 or um, is it is it spread out evenly? Uh, that's a great question. That one I'm not sure if I saw it in the paper, but uh, maybe you can take a look at it and let me know as well. Okay. I don't think I saw a study of L2 versus L0 versus L, L infinity and which one is easier because uh, then you need to look at how much time your algorithm took to come up with an adversarial example depending on your norm. Then that could be an indicator of how hard it was to find an adversarial example depending on the norm. Yeah, and I was also thinking of just the, um, the, the, size, the size of the perturbation required to, to create some mislabeling. But even then, you're comparing apples with oranges because you're measuring the size in a different norm. Yes, exactly. So I guess, yeah, I guess time, time is a better comparison now because you're that, at least that's consistent. Okay, any other questions? So that's a trend. You come up with an algorithm for attacking neural networks. You try to fix it, for instance, using defensive distillation. And then another paper comes and breaks a pattern. It says, no, I can attack your defense. And that's the, the current state of the art for that literature. In the next one, we are trying to come up with a defense. 